Excellent. Um, I'm so glad you mentioned this in, up in advance. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Charles Baird. I'm the head of data architecture at CDDO, and I'm here to very, very briefly introduce uh, Adam Locker from, Hi from National Highways and the team from BJSS, who are going to tell us about the Highways Data as a Service platform. Take it away. Hello, I'm Chris Morrissey. I'm an enterprise architect at BGSS, and I'm also the enterprise architect for the data, the data as a service system. Afternoon, I'm Adam Locker. I'm the head of data architecture and engineering at National Highways. Afternoon, my name is Gabby Hanson. I'm the Prime Services Lead at BGSS. Hi, I'm James Greenfield. I'm a service designer with Spark, part of BGSS, and I was working on data as a service from its inception. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. So I'm going to just run through a little bit of an agenda. We, we want to take you on a journey and explain to you what DAS is, Data as a Service, um, what the benefits are and how we got there. And then Adam's going to give you a bit of a view of what comes next. So first of all, just to give you a little idea of who BGSS are as an organisation. Um, BGSS are a privately owned consultancy company. We have been in operation for um, 25 years, over 25 years now. Um, we have a number of different capabilities across seven different um, service lines, uh, and we are operating internationally now with offices across um, uh, Asia, America, uh, and mainly the UK. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Adam to introduce National Highways. So uh, National Highways, I lovingly say we do the big roads. So we offer over 4,000 miles of A roads, motorways, as you can see uh, from some of the numbers on the slide. Many, many technology assets that all generate data about many different infrastructure assets, 20,000 bridges, uh, over 150,000 signs, streetlights, you, you name it. If it's on the big roads, we are running it. Um, one of the other things about National Highways is how important the roads are to the British economy. So 95 billion miles in journeys a year. And one of the most important stats here is nearly 70% of all freight in this country is going by roads. Having an efficient and effective road network where we can make decisions about how we make improvements to that network, which are based on data, is critical to the future success of the organisation. So like many government organisations, everybody wants to go from all my data's in silos, nobody's making decisions together, to all my data's joined up, and now we're making decisions that are data-driven, data-informed. But we're all shooting for the same thing. And I think what we're going to talk about today is how we got there and what we learned along the way. But the focus always needs to remain on there are people in your organisation who are very clever and know a subject matter or a domain really, really well. And fundamentally, what we're trying to do is not interlink or integrate data. We're trying to make it easier for them to spend less time on boring problems and more time on interesting problems. And one of the problems that organisations struggle with with data a lot of the time is working out if something is worth paying for. So this next slide here shows a quote from our Chief Data Officer, Davin, who says, we did an assessment of the data that we own as though it was a financial asset. And it worked out that for every two pounds of concrete tarmac or road that we have, we have an equivalent pound in data assets. By valuing that, that means that people that are in the business that make decisions at high levels have a language that they can understand to treat that data as a strategic asset. It has value, it can be, it can generate value, and you can then justify spending money on improving that asset in the short, medium, and long term. I'm going to pick up now and tell you a little bit about what DAS is. So, DAS was born of looking at this from a, a technology perspective initially and looking at being able to 
secure your data and store it centrally, but then also being able to make it accessible and available to users. So it was not just critical to ensure that technology met the requirements, but making sure that there was a consistent vocabulary uh, and that data can be accessed in an easy and optimised way so that you can then be pulling all of those insights out at the end of it and get your dashboards, get your reports, get your data science working in a completely optimised way so you're not worrying about where your data is coming from and how you're going to get hold of it in the first place. Now, what we're going to do is take you through a bit of a journey of each of those different elements. So our initial focus is taking us through from the core platform, looking at it from a technological perspective, and then making those additional layers work. So looking at that, that vocabulary part and looking at the data models and looking at that, that sort of data modeling aspects of it, and we'll go through those details, proving that all out with some addition, initial data sets. So you're not just sitting there and creating a platform with a common language around it. You're also ensuring that you're in, in making it work for an initial couple of data sets. And then you're putting a service wrapper around it. And that service wrapper is the piece that makes this available to users and understandable to users so that you and I can sit there and see what services are offered. What can this do for me and how can I access it? So how can I access the data? How can I bring more data in in an easy manner? Considering what Adam was talking about in terms of the plethora of data sources across the highways environment. You are not going to be pulling all of your data in at once. You need a repeatable, easy mechanism to do that. And then that operational support. And all of this was possible because we were looking at this in context of the vision that Highways had. An information vision and strategy had been worked out with a view of moving from being data aware through data savvy, into being data driven. So we had clarity of where Highways as an organization wanted to get to, and we understood this is the stepping stone of how to get there. And we're now gonna look through each of these different layers in turn. Thank you, Gabby. Um, so obviously one of the key things that we had to look at um, to base our, our service on, we had to have something, some sort of platform to run. And that is split into a number of key areas, which I'm just going to have a, a quick chat about now. So one of the first things we have to look at is we need to be able to ingest this data. We need to be, be able to pull it from lots of different places, lots of different stored data sources. Those data sources have different levels of quality, different sources of, of rate of information coming in. But we had to be able to look at them in a holistic way so that we weren't doing lots and lots of bespoke work in each one. We're bringing that data in. We had to have a care of duty for that data. So security has been very essential part of that platform. We have a set of firewalls and we have a hub and spoke um, topology there to allow us to be able to protect against our data being egressed out of the system when we don't want it happening. We also have our levels of um, data um, um, classification so that we can have a tiered data lake to allow different sources and um, sensitivity of data to be handled in slightly different ways and be secured in you know, using a, a role-based access system to make sure that only those users who need that data are able to access that data. Um, it also means that we allow that those pipelines which are doing that work to be able to do their stuff as a system without actually causing our data engineers and our platform engineers lots of extra work um, to be able to do that. Which means that we have those that continuous integration, deployment, and delivery of, of those pipelines to allow us to update our infrastructure rapidly. We have sets of automated tests to make sure that what we've built is actually working the way it should be working. And as we integrate stuff, then we'll be able to uh, uh, make sure that it carries on working nicely. Part of that, obviously, is with governance. We need to make sure, as I said, that we have the right access controls for people to be able to access the data in the right way have a good set of, of policies um, and, and monitor that platform to ensure it's working correctly. Um, that then ties into our data modeling. So there's some, when we have that data set coming in, we need to be able to model it in such a way that 
as as different systems talk about a pavement or a road or a carriageway, that when we actually get to the point where we want to visualize that data, they visualize and work on it in the same sort of tech, um, same sort of um, language and um, vocabulary. Um, and then finally, kind of the data presentation, which is key for those users to be able to access the data and be able to use that as simply and straightforwardly as they uh, as they are able to. So I, I kind of mentioned it in the previous one, which is having a consistent vocabulary and, and common set of data models. One of the things that we saw that the users were struggling was when they talk, talk to other parts of the business, they may they may talk about the same entities like app, but, but like apples and pears, they didn't necessarily know that they were talking about the same things. And there was a, a level of confusion or, a, or certainly a level of rework and, and, and other stuff like that that had to, to occur to make sure all the reports were consistent uh, and working across each other. So what was the answer to that? The answer was having an ontology. Uh, an ontology, in essence, is a set of, of data entities and their relationships which are mapped from the original data sources. That means we have a consistent naming of those data entities. So when reports come out and they're showing and the dashboards are showing, you're able to see the same information regardless of what data source it comes from or, um, <clears throat> or, or who, who generated that data. It really help, help informs our conceptual, our logical and our physical data models to ensure that there is that consistent nature, that commonality through it. So when people are developing reports, they don't have to relearn a set a new a new set of, of of data models because they can go on to the next report and they know that it's safe that they have that consistency from from report to report, a director to director, team to team, um, and it allows us to you know kind of really highlight where where data overlaps each other and actually find insights and ways of working that necessarily we didn't uh, see those connections before until we actually started merging those data sets into a, a single unified ontology for the whole client. Thanks, Chris. So we've heard a little bit about technology platform, um, building this consistent vocabulary. Um, both of these things are going to be new. Um, what we realised is that we needed to put service wrap around this so that what we were delivering would be usable and adoptable and successful, had to land in the business and it had to start solving problems. So some of the main challenges we had when thinking about a service wrapper were around well, how do we actually help people get data into the platform? So it's got something in it. Um, and then how do we help people get insights out of it? Because that's what we're aiming for. We want insights that can help better data-driven decision-making. So what we actually did was uh, design two services to, to bridge those gaps. So on the left-hand side, when we're thinking about getting data in, we designed an adoption service. And what we mean by this is it's helping people adopt the platform and get data into it. So the question we're asking is, well, how, people, how will people get data into the platform? Um, now, one of the tricky things here was that because it was a new platform and a lot of people didn't really understand what it might be able to do for them or what steps might be involved to get data in, we had to make a few assumptions around what that might look like. And we started building out our service offering um, to kind of test those. Um, and we also did a lot of work to understand uh, the business process that would be involved and design, design a flexible service offering to help people get data in. So this was split into two parts, one which we call project onboarding, which is helping people set up a business case. And there's a lot of different steps that we needed to get data in. And that would help them get funding so they could actually get a project in place to get data into the platform. But then also data onboarding part of that service as well. Uh, and this was to help empower teams to get data into the platform. On the right hand side, we also started to think about, well, if this is a new platform and a new service, who do we need in place to run it so it can be successful and supported uh, and make sure people can access what's in there? Um, so when we were mapping all this out, you can see at the bottom there, there's a few artifacts we put together. So on the, the left at the bottom, we had a high level blueprint. And this looked at the different user needs that we either kind of knew about or we had assumptions around and what we thought our service offering should be to meet those needs. In the middle, we had a step-by-step -step understanding of the data onboarding process, which you can probably tell by looking at that was quite, quite um, comprehensive. And then on the right, we, um, we started building out a high-level operating model of what teams we need, what will their responsibilities be, um, what does it look like? So we had a good idea of what we needed to, to design and how it should run. But the next step was actually starting to make this visible and starting to test it uh, as part of our MVP. 
Sorry. Um, so one of the things we really wanted to do when working on DAS was as much as possible to be transparent and make DAS easy to use. Um, so although we weren't uh, a project that was going to be going through a GDS assessment, we borrowed heavily on GDS principles and we took a lot of inspiration from things you find on Good UK. So, for example, if you're looking at learning to drive on Good UK, you get really nice step-by-step -step instructions that can tell you what you need to do end-to-end. And we borrowed that sort of approach and we built out a SharePoint site, which covered a number of different user cases. Like if you're working on a project that's aiming to get data into DAS, these are the steps you need to go through. Or if you're part of a data engineering team building pipelines, these are the steps you need to go to get environment access, that sort of thing. Or if you're looking to understand the ontology and that consistent vocabulary, how to use it, again, some guides and some practical advice on what that looks like. Um, and this really helped build trust uh, with the people that we were starting to, to make aware of DAS and um, what have you. And it allowed us to test early uh, when we were starting to work with our initial data sets if these instructions were actually useful and the guidance was useful. So that, that turned out to be really helpful. Um, something else that worked well was building a little bit of a brand and identity around DAS. Um, again, this was a new thing and in a, a lot of noise, the, you know, a lot of transformation going at the same time. So. Um, part of the brand of DAS was um, essentially being a service, rather than going out there and explaining to people how DAS could serve them, how data could serve them, offering this sort of consultancy advice as part of the adoption service. Uh, and people start to talk about DAS um, because it's popping up everywhere. Um, and the communications campaign on Yammer, you can see a few examples there. Again, just helping to build awareness of, um, of DAS and what was coming when we were getting ready to launch it. Um, so I just want to point out one lesson before handing over actually. One of the things we did, um, we, we kind of learned as a lesson here, was the amount of effort required to communicate and to keep communicating with people. This was part of a transformation where lots was going on. And so we ended up building a list of lots of different stakeholders that we needed to communicate to in the background. So this was all externally facing in the background doing a lot of work to connect the dots between our project and other people in the business so we can understand what they were working on that we needed to duck into so that people know about what we're doing that they might be doing aware of. Hopefully that has given you a bit of a view of all of the different component constituent parts that make up DAS, so the, the, the thing, the service that it is. Um, in terms of that, that service wrapper that made that technology available and that consistent language through utilisation of on ontology and bringing that additional data in. So now that we've taken you through a bit of this is what DAS is, we're going to take you through. Some questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think there's a first question probably for Adam and Chris, which is, do you use the Gimbal method for data lake, from data lake through to SQL Server for reporting? We can, what, we, what we've done with, with a lot of the data we've, is, is we've done a lot of analysis of it. We, we don't address to a, sing, a, a particular um, methodology. We've, we've been guided largely by what the data sets were coming in, what types we had, and then actually addressing what the users needed. So where we needed to pull from Kimball or, or other methodologies, we've kind of drawn on that based on basically the answer depends. It really is, it depended on what the data source was. I think I think we try and do as little modeling as possible at each stage because there's an overhead and a cost. Um, and getting that balance right about when to conform, yeah, when to model and when to just leave things be and see what's emerging is strict about it is one of the techniques. And the other question is operational is probably for a better, which is are we going to share the recording in slides after this to the audience? I believe so. I have no objection. Yeah, okay. great. More than more than Gabby. Okay, so now that we've gone through DAS, this next um, piece is around how we got there. What were the stages we went through? So this is a bit of a, of, of a timeline um, of events. Um, so as you can see, we had a very short period between 2019 and 2020 where we undertook a discovery exercise to understand the landscape within highways, understand all of the different governance processes, all of the different other projects that were um, going on so that we can then start building out 
a plan for delivery. Our first delivery was of what's called we call a minimum viable product. That was delivered into a test environment, wasn't delivered all the way through into a production environment. Um, and that was delivered out of schedule at the end of March 2020. We then went into a phase of productionization where we were finalizing all of the uh, scripts that were being utilized for the infrastructure, but we were also going through all of the governance activities and finalizing all of the service wrapper pieces and that collateral so that DAS had its birth at the end of August 2020 um, with an initial number of uh, data sets sitting in there um, that would serve an initial user need. From August 2020 to date, there have been a number of different data projects. So as you heard from the service wrapper perspective, there was a process that was put together so that any system owner, any project manager could come along and have a look at how do I get my data into DAS and they could leverage that. But that did mean that we have had quite a number of different projects um, running in different timelines. And this gives you a bit of a delivery approach in terms of the pieces that we delivered out of the MVP and then into production. So we had a number of different work streams that were running. Um, to do the infrastructure, the data onboarding, the service wrapper, and then the modeling activities around the ontology and production of the data list of the different data sources in highways, and then the different outputs from that. One that I'm going to call out is around data onboarding assurance. Because what was being produced was standards and guidelines, there were some templates there, but it was an MVP stage with the intention of evolving this as the service needed to evolve, as the platform needed to evolve, and as user needs changed with that service. So a process was put in place to be able to have a little bit of oversight in terms of the quality of the new data sets coming in so that you are adhering to a common standard and you keep that quality level high. So you then have confidence in the data that you've got sitting in the system. And DAS has continued that evolution. So after it went into production, there have been further improvements and further pieces around making DAS repeatable and streamlining onboarding. I'm going to hand over to Jim for some of the details. Cool, thanks, Gabby. Um, yeah, so what I want to talk a little bit around how we worked in terms of making sure that DAS could be adopted successfully. And especially around that sort of MVP phase when we were wanting to test our assumptions and we really didn't want to work in isolation. And we wanted to meet as many people as possible to understand as much as possible. So again, DAS could be launched successfully. Um, so one of the things we did was have lots of workshops with SMEs and end users. Uh, in particular, when we were building out that consist consistent vocabulary, we spent a lot of time um, speaking with people in the business to understand the words they use for data, like I think Chris mentioned, you know, sometimes in a data set, a road might be called a highway or a carriageway, even a big road. <laughs> um, but we wanted to make sure that we could build that consistent vocabulary. So as data came in, it could be utilised and we compare, join together, that sort of thing. But we needed to understand what that looked like, and that involved talking to people. So we did a lot of that. Um, we also um, spent a lot of time talking to areas of the business that we knew we needed to dock into or support people um, to engage with. For example, there was a particular um, project governance process that people would need to go through to get data into DAS. And we spent a lot of time um, with the teams who ran and maintained that process to understand what that journey looked like, where there might be pain points or obstacles or points where people need to provide quite detailed information, for example. And what that helped us do is understand how can we as a service, as a new service, help people get through that journey. Um, interestingly, that governance process was actually undergoing a review and change itself. So we had to also design our service to be very flexible so that if things change, we could still offer that support, maybe you know, you know, potentially a slightly different point, but still offer that same support to get the same outcomes for people. Also, I'm not sure if you've mentioned this, but um, as a partner, we, we weren't the only people working with highways in this initiative. As a partner, we're working, um, focusing on data science, data valuation and condition, data governance, information rights and security. Um, we're in our own work stream to an effect, but we're all part of this um, overall initiative. But the really important thing that we felt and we were very passionate about was 
making sure that we were all pulling in the same direction and that ideally it would land in the same place. So when we, when we take a step back and think about people who might be engaging with DAS or other aspects that these teams are working on, we didn't get a sense of these disparate, you know, separate pieces of the puzzle that didn't join up. We wanted this to be a, an experience for people or a service or a set of services that people could engage with with as little friction as possible. So we very much borrowed again on some of those GDS principles around doing the hard work uh, to make things simple um, and that sort of thing. We spent a lot of effort um, trying to join the dots between different um, suppliers. And I think the example you can see on the screen is, it, is a workshop we held around. We asked the question, what is a service and what makes a good service to make sure that we were, as partners, we were all thinking about that in the same way and trying to deliver the same outcomes for national highways. Cool. Thank, thanks a lot, Jim. Um, I'm just going to kind of do a little bit of a recap and kind of talk about the sort of uh, lessons that we learned along the way, the ones that we still learning on obviously no service has stand still and we need to move with with with, with the times um one of the key things that and we we covered was that having a, a a proper data vision with a sound strategy well, what do we mean by that cdo had a vision so the chief data officer had a vision of how we wanted this to work and, and that helps really to be able to prioritize and make the effective decisions even when sometimes those decisions were quite difficult to make it meant that we were able to make them early before huge amounts of impact uh, we had a service as as was, was detailed by by gabby earlier on we had a service design we needed we knew we needed to make sure that treating that data as a service was key and we need to make sure that those users were able to access that service work with us and actually give us that feedback to ensure that we weren't um, we were delivering what they needed and we weren't uh, getting in the way of them doing their own work. That kind of tied in with that, as we talked about before, making that data accessible. If it was difficult to get hold of the data. If it was difficult to get it in, it difficult to get it out. People won't use it. They just won't use the service. So we had to make it accessible and we had to make it effective for them that they said, right, actually, the easiest way of me to, to, to get that data is to come to DAS rather than going to the, the actual system of record, the place where it's mastered, because it's just make my life easier and cheaper and quicker. We had to you know, make sure that adoption plan was right. Um, and that tied in really to those three bottom points there. Keep talking to your users, get get their use cases in early, understand their cause, their problems, the things that can that, that can really add value to them early. Keep on talking to them. Remember that the base, user base can change over time. So stuff that was stable or, or decisions you made two years ago may not be may not be safe today and, and carry on thinking about that. And keep that persistent communication. They're gonna like stuff, the users, they're gonna hate stuff. And you've got to try and make sure you adapt and, and, and don't work with that. During that, <coughs> thank you. Um, during that period, obviously, um, there was a lot of challenges faced, and, and we've talked about it before. So Jim mentioned about the supply landscape, working those partnerships, and he deliberately used that word partnership because suppliers, you know, have have agendas. If we work as partners, leaving the badge at the door, as um, as Highway CTO um, ma mentions quite frequently, that 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 work is actually getting better and, and easier to do, and actually we're going to get more delivery. Um, we had initially, because uh, of, of the way that um, that we were building the ontology and the modeling, we had to do make a lot of decisions early on that we thought were the right ones because we weren't able to get to the users that we want to because they were busy, they had their day jobs. Um, and and slowly, slowly but surely, we've been able to look at some of those decisions and, and, make, and change and adapt them to, to fit where we wanted to. Complex funding is a key area and, and like many departments throughout the government, uh, a lot of, of, of work is funded by projects. But we were talking about an enterprise wide and cross project service here. So trying to kind of pull the strings to make sure that something that was across highways was funded in the best best way and we could exploit as much as possible from, from that. Everyone had to cope with COVID. Uh, we were a team co-located in two main offices and quickly we kind of, after, after the lockdown, we all went in together. Uh, we were able to use things like Zoom, Teams and stuff to be able to build those um, those connections, build communities of practice so that we could support the different elements of the teams, both users and, and, and engineering. Um, and that allowed us to be able to adapt quite quickly and be able to get um, delivery, get going very quickly. Um, but it was a challenge to get that message out. And then also we, we felt really early on that we needed to get a critical mass of data in there. If there wasn't enough data inside of DAS, people won't use it, which meant there was a lot of huge amount of data engineering, as Adam mentioned early on, to try and get that data in. And now we're really kind of being able to, now that we have that critical mass, 
We're starting to get enough data in there to make sure that people are really coming to us as the first port of call to be able to start looking at those insights and bringing them out. And as Jim mentioned earlier on, we had to build on those shifting sounds when, when processes and policies were being changed within a, a never changing national highways and be able to adapt to them. And a and final bit, and people kind of talk about DAS as a, as a platform, it's more than a platform, it's not just a bit of tech. Um, we started off to a, a certain point of making ease of use of accessibility. So therefore, you know, in, in kind of uh, quite tech speak, we were a system of reference. We, we didn't want users to go to the original sources. We wanted them to come to DAS first. Now we've involved to include much more, and especially through continuous feedback and continuous improvement, we're, we're tying into some of, of Highway's key aims of helping them, helping the organization be a data proficient place and providing those services to highways to ensure that they can move through that from data proficient into the data savvy and into the data uh, driven ecosystem that highways wants to be over the next four to uh, five to 10 years. And that will allow us then, you know, have those repeatable shareable patterns, be able to not just have one instance of DAS like we have today, but multiple ones so that um, based on commercial or, or mm -hmm. local or, or legal reasons that the right patterns, the lessons we've learned and been able to feed back into the into the into the service is is is, is there for highways um, um, for a long time to come. Okay, so my job really is to keep one eye on where we're going, and DAS as it stands now is like very many data improvement projects in many government departments. It's, it's an act of centralisation. And that is great because it actually delivers a working product people like and use. However, can't go on centralising all the things forever because the problem becomes that your data team becomes the bottleneck in your organisation and, you know, stay alive long enough and you become the villain, as they say, and then that's what your product will come. So the way that me and my team look at it is, OK, on the left of this slide, you can see that there is the hierarchy of Strategic goals inform architectural principles. Architectural principles are demonstrated through the practices. You can show people how these practices work with patterns, and sometimes you literally shove something under their nose. That's a product that you can see that through line from why are we doing this? How do we do this? So this is the thing that does this. But we also think that this is exploitable hierarchy in the other direction. So if you start with a product, that's something tangible that people can wrap their heads around. By turning it into a pattern, you're then making it so that it's a set of capabilities that can be reused across the organisation. One of the most um, challenging things about the data space that people always forget is um, buy before uh, uh, reuse, then buy, then build. Is sort of one of the great pillars of um, particularly public sector digital expenditure. But data is a little bit different, I think, because all of the all of the cost is in the accrued entropy over however many years where we've treated things as silos. And there's only one currently. There's only really one way out of that until you know uh, stable diffusion for data engineering comes along, and that is to engineer your way out. So you can't go on engineering forever because the costs go on. So how do we make DAS and the engineering components that we built for it a reusable pattern so they're a bit more assemblable? How do we then make this set of capabilities, a set of practices in the organisation? So we are just supporting those practices and the parts of the organisation that create, consume, use data to leverage them. Once you've done that and demonstrated that and that becomes the way of working, well, then you've You've diffused a principle throughout the organisation. And if you do it right, if you do it well, I think that you can then fundamentally change an organisation to be data driven or data informed, whichever, whichever aim you're going for. And that's what we're trying to do with DAS, I think, is, is show people a thing, a tangible thing, give them something, get them excited and then push it back up the hierarchy through a combination of good service design, and stealth. <laughs> okay, and we're going to open the floor to any questions that anybody has. If there's anyone who'd like some more information on any of the points that we've raised.
Um, we do have one more question, it's technical, which is uh, how do you choose lakes over warehouse and on data bricks? I think you can have, with, with the way we've done it, you can have both. Um, there are going to be certain circumstances. So the way our lake is organized is that the data comes in, it's raw. Sometimes you just want to archive that data. So let's just, just, just store it in something cold and, and cheap. Um, then sometimes, you know, there's very few data users. So you turn you just turn that data into something that's much just much quicker to process. So what we call our operational data service. And it just means that it's the same data model the data came in, but it's just really quick to run. The next then step is to turn that data into what we call curated, which is the stuff that is 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 like the um, the ontology. And most of that work should be still sitting in the data lake because that's efficient, especially a lot of reports are consolidating, collating, enhancing, counting, summing, all that sort of stuff. That's that sort of data is, is better and then works more efficiently and is cheaper to look after and save in the data lake. And then really use the warehouse where um, those complex and, and then lots of, of joins and tied uh, workloads that mean you need that power of that warehouse. So it's helping the, the users understand who are now at the moment most used, used to relational databases um, and, and, and think, right, I'm going to write a SQL code, piece of code. Well, you know, is there a, a different way to look at it? Is there, is there a different set of tooling that you can do that? And that's where data lake houses will come in and, and being able to use technology such as Databricks, um, especially Databricks now with all these SQL, SQL extensions and stuff, will ease that burden and ease that transition for users to be able to say, right, Where's the best place for my workload to run? And we'll provide that, you know, that training, those tutorials, those how-tos and stuff to help them out. Help them. Anything else you want to talk about, Adam? Nope. Cool. Hopefully I've answered your question, man. Got more question on the, how do you manage the ontology? Very well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we use a uh, combination of so the I believe we use Web Project for general authoring of the ontology. Yeah, there is a website called ontopop.com where we have a front end of our ontology for anyone to explore. And that is, uh, you can go in there and look at that right now if you want. Uh, this is a discussion that's currently going on with my team is um, what are the products, practices, et cetera, that we need to be able to diffuse um, ontology authorship, I guess, custodianship throughout the organization a bit because again an ontology is only as good as it is well maintained i think so making sure that we have a range of offerings for people to be able to do very basic to more complex things within ontology and a bit taxonomy as well is something that we're looking at now at the moment it is just a combination of web protege and a truck store i think mm -hmm. We've got some, some exciting questions coming in. Um, so, taking the question again, is it a mixture of batch and streaming based on use case study? It is very much that, isn't it? It's at the moment mostly batch. In fact, it's almost an old batch, um, partly because some of the data sources, so like Entis, which is the National Traffic Information Service, and you can tell how many times we've said that, thought of it, so we can roll rolls off the tongue. Um, that's the data that's coming off the network. That's the, you know, your vehicle's past you. There was a lorry with three axles and so on. That data is, it comes in daily. You know, it comes in one big batch for us at night. We have done trials and processes where we've been streaming data from um, well-recognized vehicles. Like, for example, we had a, um, a proof of concept where we were getting Apple planing and uh, ABS events from, from, from one of those manufacturing systems. We were able to combine that with the weather. We were able to combine that with the network, and we were able to see micro flooding appearing on site on, on the on the on the road network where the where the um, drainage sensors wouldn't have sensed it because they were two three hundred yards apart, and that could in future be taken as a further project to go right. Let's have more localized uh, maintenance on just those areas because we know there's some hot spots there. I also think you got the cons the organisation creates a set of constraints as well. So nearly every service that we have at the moment. Is it's much easier to embed it on the organisation through batching. It's much easier for people to grasp. The files get dropped off here, they get processed overnight. We are looking at building some capability, and um, fortunately, on their architecting platform, they have one eye on having a speed layer so the streaming can be done, etc. It's about aligning the, the use cases that you need so that you've got something tangible to test when you come to need those additional capabilities. I would say if you're about to start on this, in the short term, unless you're already quite mature in the streaming space, except that you're probably going to be doing a lot of batching, and that's actually fine, I think. Yeah. It, it still works. People have been using it for years. So.
Absolutely. But as, as Adam says, architects are the account stream. And I think the point there about use cases, at the end of the day, you can't boil the ocean. You can't do every single use case you can think of because you'd never have a product. So pick those use cases that provide the most value and slowly but surely add more and more use cases to that service. And that service then will provide more and more value over time without actually bankrupting the, uh, the organization who's funding it. Uh, another question is, when you looked at resolving problems with language, did you look only on a data or did you look at the service to? So the scope of the ontology at the minute is just data because we have to find the context somewhere, hence domain-driven design. Um, don't really talk about it too much, but we have another thing where we've got uh, ontological information about the people in the organisation, the processes in the organisation, the outcomes of the organisation, which is being finished. Um, I'm really looking forward to being able to show people that. It's uh, what I showed you on my first day. It's one of the coolest things I've ever seen for helping people understand how an organization as, a, as an entity actually functions. So the ontology itself at the moment is just data. There are some work, there's some work going on at the business to build ontologies for other uh, domains within the organization. The bit that we've done on um, people process systems is coming and you know, I think it'd be ready before day you know, 23, but I think it's something we'll definitely be looking to show off there. Yeah. Um, do you have and are you able to share any data on adoption and cost per transaction? Mm, I don't I don't know. Can I take that one away, please? <laughs> <laughs> um, and now that you've increased the efficiency of data production with highways, when will this data be available to the public? Soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> We're about to embark on a fairly big piece of work in the new financial year about making data more available. I think that's all I can say about it at the moment. Again, that may be a whole session of Data Connect 23, all being well, and almost certainly be one at Data Connect 24, yeah. which, you know, will still be around by then, Charles. Right? Yeah. <laughs> also, also, also on that one, also we have a take care of duty of that data. There's some data which you can anticipate coming off the network, which has very high levels of sensitivity and given GDPR and stuff like that. Before we release any data to the public, we have to make sure the mechanisms of getting that data doesn't allow the data we want to keep sensitive being accessed. So there is a huge amount of, of due diligence that we're working on there. So we want to make sure what we build is a robust and safe uh, service. Uh, someone says that they're writing these questions down for next year's schedule. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, so, yeah, we've got here, what, what are the kind of learnings, surprises, and, and if there's anything that you would do differently uh, if you had to do it again? I think I'd, I'll take that one to start with. So, um, from, a, from a supplier, new supplier perspective, coming into a complex environment such as national highways with all of the different directorates, with all of the different transformation projects that were ongoing, I think the the biggest learning, I think it's something we knew already, but it was really proven out, was the benefits of service design in pulling this together. So you're not just looking at it from a technology perspective, you really are considering those end users and you're considering what those end users need, but you're not locking it down to the nth degree. You're giving that amount of flexibility. So you're saying, this is my initial version, but no, it's going to change and we want it to change with you. Um, and and that, that side of things really has been the biggest benefit. The biggest surprise, I think, to us when we walked in the door was the amount of transformation going on across the organisation in nearly every single department that we spoke to about any of the aspects of process, any of the aspects of operations or any of the aspects of data. There was some level of transformation that was ongoing. So that really posed a, a significant challenge in, in what we were doing. Um, what would we do differently if we did it again? Um, I think some of the user comms aspects of it, and I think getting more involvement in some of the user groups and more involvement with some of the user conversations about data usage, about data consumption, and you know, creating that community of practice at an earlier stage, which is always a considerable balancing act because. You don't want to do it too early in a project before you've got something to talk about and something to show, but you don't want to do it too late 
when you've actually got a product out of the door and people are then trying to run to catch up with what you're doing. So getting that getting that balancing act, I think, is is a really key one. Uh, have you guys got something to add? Yeah, I've got um, one thing that we mentioned there that, the, that Gabby mentioned. It's about transformation. Um, but when you use the word transformation, people think that, well, I'm going to transform and then I'm not going to start. I'm going to get back to normal. Um, I think one thing we've learned from this is that actually change is normal. It's, it's all, that's, that's perpetual. So therefore, that's why we talk about continuous improvement, continuous deployment and delivery. Um, transformation can give people kind of change fatigue because they think, well, I've been transforming for the last three years. When am I going to not stop? When am I going to stop transforming? So if you kind of think, well, actually, we're just going to carry on getting better. That kind of has a, a different connotation. It makes feel people better that, well, actually, I'm going to carry on getting better all the time. And our service is going to get better. We're going to provide more value. And I think that gives a, a, diff, a totally different uh, vibe to the to change rather than just thinking, was I wrong in the first place? I think just, I mean, you've said sort of really good stuff. But I think just to add, not to, um, we need to do, do it again, not to underestimate the amount of effort it requires to help the organisation adopt the new thing. Um, there was a lot of effort behind the scenes to just to do it. It's almost a project in itself, wasn't it? I think Gabby, the biggest surprise to me was the amount of stakeholders Gabby had on the stakeholder list was 300 plus. Yeah. I mean, wow. <laughs> so that's a lot of people to keep in full right? Um, we keep we keep getting great questions. So um, have you and I, or are you planning on extending the ontology into data models and would this be beneficial for transparency? Yep. Yeah, I think the ontology is the basis of conceptual modeling because it shows the entities that are in your world, I think. This is the that is the way in which you can divorce data models which are tightly coupled to services from the way you want to model your world. So the way I always see it is ontology is the basis for conceptual models, which are I think the purpose of conceptual models is fundamentally to get the concept into people's heads of what it is, what it isn't, etc. From there you can start to build uh, logical models as patterns. That's what you want to get to. I think you don't go any deeper than that because you know, it's the engineering part. But that, yes. Uh, can you speak a bit around overcoming the funding challenge and support for such a work and service that, that is of enterprise-wide value in perpetual nature? And what are you are in an organisation which looks at every initiative with the project lens? So I wasn't here at the time, but what I will say is that you need someone who is savvy in that area and can navigate that environment and understand and explain to people like the chief financial officer, for example, what the value proposition you're making is and why. And we're very lucky that we've got CDF that's very good at that. So um, it is, however, I think um, one of the biggest weaknesses of how public sector organisations operate that may never change. So it's a, you sort of meet it in the middle. How can I compartmentalise what we want to achieve into a way that people can understand for a funding purpose? Once you start delivering, then you may get closer to a point where you get to the Sunday uplands of we fund a team, we identify the outcome, we let them go out. That's a very scary place for senior leaders to go to. I think they're not quite ready yet. But it starts with being able to deliver something into your business that gives people value, that gives people the feels. Mm. It's playing the game, right? Yeah, to a degree. Yeah. Um, so how did you structure the workshops with project and process owners? Did you use a framework or st of standard questions, for example? I think when we were building out the ontology and trying to understand that consistent vocabulary, I think the, the team very much had a structured approach that they were speaking to each team and they were trying to understand um, all of that sort of landscape for sure. I, off the top of my head, I can't remember what that looked like, but I know it was very much a structured set of questions. Um, when we were talking to uh, the people who understood, uh, they saw that governance, project governance process, for example, um, that almost led itself because Luckily, they had a map of what that process looked like, and we were able to just ask them to walk us through it and explain it. And then we could start to ask questions around where might the pain points be for people, who does what, and that sort of thing. Um, so it, it, I suppose it depends on what you're trying to get out of that particular session. Um, if you're doing lots of sessions and having a consistent approach can be good. Other times, it's just getting to know people and talking to people and understanding 
how does this thing sit within the landscape we're trying to understand? It's also about building trust, wasn't it? You know, making a safe space in those workshops, making sure that people felt that they could talk about what they wanted to talk about without judgment, without being um, opinions getting in the way, and just kind of be in that, that place of, of trust and safety so that you can actually be able to kind of cover their problems and get that information out. And also asking, is there anyone else I should speak to? Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's the thing. You don't know everything when you start something. And just being curious and asking, talking to people, that makes it helps build that trust. And it helps you out as a part of the world because you start to understand more about the organisation and try to support. And it builds out a phenomenal stakeholder. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we have run out of questions. Are there any closing words? Anything that we want to wrap up with? I think from a from a DGSS perspective, it has been and continues being a pleasure working with mm. National Highways. So, um, as a as a client and as a group of individuals, it's been an amazingly good, positive, open relationship. And I think that is one of the reasons it's been quite so successful because we can trade the information, we can be honest with each other, and we can work in partnership to be able to deliver the outcomes. I think at times it can feel so massive, it's overwhelming. So just baby steps it each day. If you make it a little bit better, you've made it a little bit better. I think that's what all any of us can do, really. It's, yeah. it's like turning the oil tanker. So um, with, a, yeah. with a canoe paddle. <laughs> times. Thank you very much to everyone who attended. We will be sending out slides and recording afterwards. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Bye.